It's a real pleasure to be here. Happy Thursday, everybody. Skills for Change is an organization for which I have great admiration. I won't say it's a thankless job, but helping new Canadians find, retain, and excel in the workplace is something I believe is not enough of a priority in our society. I just want to tell you a personal story. I'm an immigrant. I came here with my mother and three brothers and sisters in 1967. And at 21 years old, my parents separated and my mother had to do a lot of the things that Skills for Change does for new immigrants now on her own. Figure out how to go back to school, how Canadian society really operates from an employment perspective. So I'm pleased to know that Skills for Change has made this a priority. And not only have countless new arrivals to this country benefited as a result, we all benefit. That notion that we all benefit when the needs and concerns of all people in our society are embraced is of course central to what Skills of Change does, and it is central to what I do. Back in 2008, Ontario took a bold step forward and became the first jurisdiction in Canada to create a diversity office for its public service, an office committed to creating an inclusive culture for the country's biggest provincial <coughs> public service. Our job at the Ontario OPS is, OPS, I'm going to use um, words like that, the Ontario Public Service Diversity Office, is to drive a culture of inclusion and make the words diversity and accessibility less scary and more positive. There are a lot of reasons for this, of course, but the underlying one, as we all know, is that our, our diversity is our strength, and to acknowledge it and to build on it is to strengthen ourselves as a province, a country, and a society. As Minister Couteau has already mentioned, research has shown that diverse workplaces are more creative, fostering greater innovation and product productivity than others. The fact that Ontario is home to people from many different countries with different languages and cultures provides a huge inherent bonus to our workforce. The same applies to people with different sexual orientations or those who face challenges because of disabilities. The combination of our unique perspectives, recognized and appropriately utilized, could position our province as a, central, as a center of innovation within North America. And this is why I'm pleased to be here at this conference, talking and exchanging ideas about how best to drive accessibility and inclusion in the workplace for the benefit of all. Currently, I'm employed in a very important workplace, the Ontario Public Service. 64,000 people charged with delivering excellent public service to 13 million Ontarians. Bringing significant culture change to an organization like that is extremely challenging and very important. We're talking, after all, about changing how people think about and see the world. Because you can spend money and build a road or a school. You can make a rule against parking in front of hydrants or pass a law to prevent people from stealing and enjoy a fair amount of success. But spending money and making rules won't change the, the way people think. It may, maybe, change how they act. But if you really want to make the world more inclusive, you have to change how people think about that world. You have to change their underlying assumptions about that world. And the important thing to understand about that is they may not know they make those assumptions. I'll come back to that in a moment, but let me give you some very quick background information. Last year, we released a plan called Inclusion Now 2013-16. We wanted to move from the how, the business case, Sorry, from the what, the business case, to the how. I was happy to hear Sarana say that that's part of the dialogue over the course of the day. This year's three, this three-year diversity plan was designed to build on the progress we made since 2008 and continue the process we had begun of transforming the Ontario Public Service. Our goal is to become a strong, inclusive organization that reflects the diversity of all Ontarians at all levels of the organization. 
provides first-class public services and enables employees to reach their full potential. An organization, in other words, that leads by example on the journey to inclusion. The plan breaks down roughly in four priority areas. The first is informed, committed, and competent leadership. The second focus is behavioral and cultural transformation in the workplace. And the third is mainstreaming and integrating inclusion. We also finally measure and evaluate and report on our results. Today, I want to speak to you about our second area of focus, behavioral and cultural transformation in the workplace. This will be our main focus over the next two years, and it's the focus of the little team that I work with. Basically, how we can plan to change behavior and ultimately impact the organizational culture and the systems and structures that need to be changed. As I mentioned earlier, we start by providing opportunities for people to understand the assumptions which they may or may not know that they have. We've looked at a social, social scientist named Jonathan Haidt, who recently drew upon ancient wisdom created and created a perfect metaphor for our work, Explain, explaining why it's important to focus on behavioral transformation. It's called the elephant and the rider. So I want you to think about and picture a rider on an elephant. The elephant is very, very large, and the rider is very, very small. The rider represents our conscious control processes of the mind, the planning and reasoning. The elephant represents the unconscious mind and the hundreds of automatic decisions we carry out every second outside of conscious awareness. The elephant represents our emotions and our assumptions, the assumptions that drive our behaviors. The rider has very little influence on behavior. The rider is our conscious mind and responsible for that which we control or have, we think we have control over. Although she can look into the future, imagine hypothetical scenarios and make plans, the rider can, can't actually order the elephant to do anything. The problem is, in a direct contest between the rider, the conscious mind, and the elephant, the unconscious mind, the elephant will win every time. Essentially, most of us don't realize the impact of the elephant on us on a day-to-day -day basis. We're baffled and give ourselves a hard time when we don't stick to our resolutions and don't carry out the actions that we know we should be doing. That's why if we want to change behavior, the ways in which people actively think about things, we have to get through to and change those underlying assumptions. We have to train the elephant. Our strategy for creating behavioral and cultural transformation in the OPS is by taking action in three key areas. Inclusive leadership, a middle manager strategy, and an anti-racism framework. In all of these areas, however, we are guided by the understanding that it is always the unconscious underlying assumptions that must be our real target. In the Ontario Public Service, we have tools we have templates, we have policies, we have practices, we have lenses. We have all of the things that we, people could use effectively to make sure that everyone feels included in the workplace. But for example, what we're starting with in this new Inclusion Now plan is promoting inclusive leadership where we're, where we're encouraging our senior staff to practice what we call the three I's, introspection, intention and integration and there's a reason we're beginning with introspection we need people to understand who they are and how they really really think about diversity before they can begin the process of changing themselves or the environments in which we work it's much the same with our middle managers their immediate impact on how on those around them is so extensive that we must support them with a variety of tools that will help them assess themselves and the culture around them and decide how best to influence it. Recently, or maybe about a year ago, when I was still at RBC, I met someone who told me that the culture, so how people feel about the organization, and many of you probably heard this, is within 50 feet of a manager's desk. 
The manager creates how people feel about the organization, whether they feel included or whether they feel excluded. As for the anti-racism strategy, what lies at the heart of this strategy is our understanding of how, we, how deeply emotional a subject race is. I'd like to just try a little experiment, if you'll indulge me. If I say to you, and I want you all to reflect on how you, you immediately feel, not think about the following, but how you feel when I say this. I have experienced barriers in the workplace as a woman. Now I want you all to reflect on how you immediately feel, not think about the following. I have experienced barriers in the workplace as a black woman. The minute race becomes part of the discourse, emotions are heightened for everyone, no matter their race, gender, sexual orientation, creed, and so forth. If we don't recognize the work of anti-racism as deeply emotional and unconscious, then we run the risk of escalating emotions and, in fact, aggravating and alienating people. The elephant reacts and starts rumbling before the rider even realizes. In the past, too many times to even think about it, I have made the mistake of believing that we could have honest dialogue about the impact of race-based assumptions on our organization. And the result, invariably, was that 98% of the time, the elephant reared its head and the dialogue was shut down. The team I work with recognizes that we need to build tools, resources, and training that allows people at all levels of the OPS to become more comfortable with discussing race and identifying race-based assumptions that they and others might be making at a personal system and process level. We are encouraging and allowing people to evaluate their assumptions instead of falling back on them unconsciously. Assumptions about race and religion and gender and sexuality, for example. And the tools and programs we are developing will allow us to provide people with opportunities to begin to have honest, open conversations about the systems we work in and who they support and who they encourage. The OPS is a large organization situated in a larger society, and that society is in exactly the same position as the organizations that we work in. I know everyone in this room does the same thing I occasionally do, which is wonder about how great, how great a society it would be if everyone in it honestly evaluated our assumptions and then behaved accordingly. Some days, as I do this work, it feels like we've been stuck in our ability to deal with these issues, and changing how we think is key to getting unstuck. I believe if we keep pursuing the goals together, we will get there one day. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>